So why don't we read this together, all right? Uh, could you guys see those letters well enough? All right, let's read this together. Okay. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Maria. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Cliffhanger. <laughs> so before we get into that, we have this. Right? There was a young teacher teaching her kindergarten class about farm animals. So she asked the question, children, what do chickens give you? And one of the little girls said, eggs. And she said, wonderful, right. Then she asked, what do pigs give you? And another little boy said, bacon. She said, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, right. And then she said, what does the big round cow give you? And another little boy said, homework. That one takes a little bit. <laughs> Remember their jokes. <laughs> that was moving, wasn't it? Let's see how long we can milk that one. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, this is a great story, uh, the story of Abraham. And um, we have to go back, right, to... to to who is Abraham? Abraham started his journey in the Bible as a man called Abram. And um, one day, this man, Abram, heard something he had never heard before. He heard the voice of God. And God calls Abram to leave his father's house. His father's house, where we, we kind of get a picture of what it was or what the environment was like where his father's house was. It was a place of idol worship. It was a place of many different gods. Yet here is Abr Abram hearing something different. Hearing something, a voice saying, I'm the creator. Leave your father's house and go where I have sent you. Now that's hard. Everything that you've been used to in life, everything that is provided for you, everything that you've known to come in your life, all of a sudden you're being told, leave it behind and move to where I am sending you. So what does Abram do? He obeys God. And he takes that move. He takes that step and leaves his father's house. 
He takes his wife and, and he takes his servants with him. He takes whatever is his and they head, head out toward this land that God had told him to go to. As, um, as he's journeying to this land, again, he has another encounter with God. And God tells him that he will make him from Abram to Abraham. And I got to explain that. He will make him from Abram to a father of a multitude, a father of many nations. Now, I'm pretty sure that as his name is changed, Abraham is thinking, how is this possible? I'm, I'm about 70 years old. My wife is in her 60s. We haven't had a child yet. How is this possible? But he believes God. He believes the same God that told him, leave your father's house. And he did it. This, this takes faith on part of Abraham. And then finally, we go through the whole story where um, Abraham's wife, Sarai, um, tries to help God out and um, tells Abraham, maybe if you go with my servant and they have a baby, maybe this child of blessing that God talked to you about, about being a father of many nations, of, of, of multitudes, maybe this will happen. And that wasn't to be. It didn't work out. And God himself now comes to Abraham. God himself visits Abraham. And reestablishes the promise that out of Abraham, all people of the world will be blessed. That's quite a promise. In the middle of this, Abraham says, but how is this possible, Lord? I have no real inheritance from the promise from my wife. My wife is barren. And God says, Sarai will conceive a child. Well, she's listening in the background and she starts giggling. And so as she's giggling, God asks her, what are you laughing about? Oh, no, no. Not me. He says, I'm changing your name too. From Sarai to Sarah, which means princess. Princess, someone who sits over a kingdom. And then we know the story where he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah and, uh, and, and frees Lot out of there and uh, sends the angels to get him out. But in the middle of that, short time later, Abraham and Sarah have a child finally. Unlike Bob, who had all the great grandchildren that were boys and then finally the girl. This one was a boy, right? It was Isaac. And they have this son of promise, Isaac. Could you imagine? You left your household. You left everything you know in life to follow this voice of God that tells you to go somewhere because I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And finally, there it is. There he is. The child, the son of this promise. Now you could see God's promise coming true. Now you could see it in, uh, physically what God has been speaking about. Could you imagine the joy that Abraham had? Could you imagine Sarah walking around with two pillows, making sure this kid never scratches his knees? And one day, as the child gets older, God speaks to Abraham one more time. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, Take this child of promise, Isaac, and sacrifice him to me. 
I don't know about you, but the day that the doctor called me and told me that my daughter had an illness that was going to take her life, my heart fell. I mean, it was like physical. I could feel the weight physically of the world just falling on me and crushing me. I could imagine what Abraham felt like at this moment. God, this is the son of promise. This is the one we've been waiting for. And then Abraham's faith kicks in. And he starts the preparations to take his son to this place that God had told him to, to sacrifice him. Could you imagine Abraham walking with the donkeys and with the servants and with his son and thinking, God, you, you took me out of my household of my father's house where there were idol worshipers. And what consisted with idol worshipers was the sacrifice of human life. I thought you were different, God. Struggling and yes, you are different. Yes, you are. How many of you have ever been through that, through that struggle? Huh? There's part of you that has these questions for God, but yet there's part of you that knows that God is going to provide. If he told you, he will do it. And so Abraham prepares and they go on their way. And as they go on the way, I mean, there's, there's so many parallels here with our savior, Jesus. You know, here is God asking Abraham to give his one and only beloved son. And yet we read in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. When we think about little Isaac, we say little, most likely he was about 16, 17 at the time. But when we think about Isaac carrying the wood that he was going to be sacrificed on. And then we think about Jesus carrying the cross on which he was going to give his life on. So many things that are the same in this story. A father giving his one and only son. A son willing to carry the instrument of his death. So we kind of know the story. I, I pray most of us do. But for those of us that don't, right? They prepare everything. They, uh, um, um, Abraham uh, stacks the wood up. And, and by now, Isaac, he's, he's been through this sacrifice thing with his father before with animals and stuff. And he says, Father, you know, we have the wood. We have the fire. We have the knife. We have everything. Where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And that's when Abraham says, the Lord himself... God himself will provide. He tells his two servants, wait here and we will return. <coughs> See, we could just skip over that or we could stop and examine it a bit. We will return. Even now, Abraham is still struggling to believe God. That even, as Hebrews tells us, even if Isaac were to die, Abraham is believing that God has the power and the ability to bring him back. So he takes Isaac, right? he lays him on top of these, uh, on top of the wood. After they built the altar out of rocks, he, he puts the wood down and he lays his son on there and he lifts the knife. To cut the young man and sacrifice him. And just as he lifts his arm, <coughs> the word of the Lord comes down. And well, I mean, this is the highlight, guys. Just. As he raises his arm to slay Isaac, God speaks. Now, throughout the years, um, there's been a discussion by those that study the Bible on 
the next part of this. God says to Abraham, stop, do not harm the lad. For now I know that there is nothing that you would withhold from me. Now the argument has been if God who knows all things, God that knows the future, why would he have to test Abraham? And what the answer to that for many has been that God was not really testing Abraham, even though it says he was. I mean, God knew all things, that the test was for Abraham himself. So that he would recognize where his own heart was and how far he would go in obeying God. You see, when we go through trials, when we go through different... Now remember, there's the difference between trials and temptations. But when we go through those, many times we, we would ask um, God, right? Why are you testing me? But the test sometimes is for ourselves. What are we willing to do for Christ? How far are we willing to go for Jesus? You see, this is the God who would never ask anyone to sacrifice their child. Abraham knew God's character. And he had the faith and in that spot, at that moment, they heard rustling in the bushes. And when they looked, here was a ram stuck with its uh, horn stuck in, in the branches. And so um, Abraham says, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. The King James uses Jehovah Jireh, which is a direct translation of Yahweh Yari. God or the Lord will provide. How many of you want to say that with me? <laughs> Yahweh Yari. You, you, do you dare say that? Yahweh Yari. But the Lord himself, the Lord will provide. And he even named that mountain the Lord will provide. So this way, everyone who's ever come through there would remember that God is the provider. That God will provide. And God has provided for you and me. God has provided for us. He has provided for us our salvation. Through the blood and through the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus Christ. You see, this was one sacrifice God did not put the brakes on. Jesus was taken to a mock trial, brutalized by sinful men, made to carry his cross to Mount Calvary and crucified there because God wanted to provide for us salvation. Salvation. That's the parallel we see from, from this mount where uh, Isaac was saved from, where Abraham was asked to take and, 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 and do this sacrifice. The parallel to that is Mount Calvary. Where God provided for Abraham, he's providing for us, the children of Abraham. Listen, every culture in the world talks about Abraham. God's promise that the world's the, the nations of the world would be blessed by Abraham's seed. But the biggest blessing that comes from Abraham's seed comes in the person of Jesus Christ himself. See, it was John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29, that makes this proclamation. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Listen, it doesn't, it doesn't just say the Lord did provide, 
but the Lord will provide. That we could always look toward the future for God to provide this grace, this mercy, this love, this peace that the world looks for. God will provide. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall provide all your needs in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you have something to write with, as I close here, I want to leave you with these points of God's provision for us. We see where God has provided the most important thing, a doorway for our salvation. But number one, also, God also provides a safe refuge. In a culture where people are talking about safe places, places to hide, we have a refuge in our God who promised to be our protector. The second thing is God will save us from evil and our enemies. The third thing is God will strengthen and encourage us. These are things that God provides for us. How many of you need to be encouraged and strengthened? I know every morning I do. Every night I do. Every day. I need God's strength and encouragement in my life. The fourth thing is God will sanctify us through and through. R.C. Stroll says that justification or justification without sanctification can't exist. You need to have sanctification and God wants to sanctify us through and through five God will hear and answer our humble cries. You know, the Bible tells us that a humble and contrite heart, God will not turn away. Six, God will grant us mercy and forgiveness. We may not always be able to walk on a cloud. We may stumble we may say something we shouldn't have. But when we turn in repentance, God's mercy and forgiveness is offered to us. Seven, God will give us his peace. And as I mentioned earlier, the world is crazy looking for peace, trying to find peace in so many different things in the political realm, in the secular realm. But yet, if you have peace with your maker, that supersedes everything. There's nothing that could steal that from you. Eight, God will bless us and make us a blessing. So many times we pray, God, bless me here and bless me there and bless me over there. And God bless this mess. But what we fail to see that as children of God, God desires to make us conduits of his blessing. Where his blessings don't just come down and stop here, but they run through us to others. Number nine, God will give us his wisdom. The Bible says that if any of you is lacking wisdom, ask and God will give you in abundance. This is James talking. 10, God will sustain and support us forever. Sustain and support us forever. Like I said before, it says the Lord will provide. This is looking toward the future, isn't it? In the here and in the future. It's not something that's past. Oh, I remember when I was a little child. I mean, I talked to so many people. Oh, when I was a child, I used to go to that church. I used to go to Sunday school. 
It's like, well, then God's blessings for you are in the past. Continue in the path of seeking God daily so that his provision and his blessings will be constant and in the future for you. Where am I at? Who's paying attention? (laughs) 10. Okay, so we're going to 11, right? God will reward us and lift us up. God will reward us and lift us up. Number 12. God will be, glo- will be glorified in us forever when we accept and allow his provision to be part of our lives. And this isn't one of the 12, but just to cap it off, God will provide safety for those that put their faith and trust in him, live with him forever in his kingdom. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you this. So that where I am, you can be also. How many of you want to be where Jesus is? Even on the night when Jesus was betrayed and sat with his disciples, we see where God was providing. This is the physical picture of God providing for us, our salvation.